Like giants, or even gods, we're very much used to seeing our model railways from above. And maybe that's part of the appeal, looking down on something we've created. But with my Raspberry Pi powered wagon cam, we can get a different perspective. A driver's eye point of view, streamed to our PC or smartphone over the Wi-Fi network, using a piece of free software called MotionEye. And in this video, I'll show you exactly how I made it. At the heart of the wagon cam is a Raspberry Pi Zero. We'll need the version with Wi-Fi. And I've chosen the option of the pre-soldered headers, the WH, for convenience. You'll need the first generation one rather than the Zero 2, as MotionEye isn't compatible with the newer chip. Then we need a camera, and I've got one from the range specially designed for the Zero, picking the one without the infrared coating for that surveillance camera vibe. Next we need a way of powering it while it's on the move, and for this I've got a small lithium polymer battery and an Adafruit power boost to manage the connection to the Zero and recharge the battery between runs. We'll see how to wire that up later on, but first let's install the camera, releasing the cable clamp with thumbnail or small screwdriver, and inserting the ribbon cable with the connectors facing the board, ensuring it's in as far as it will go, before sliding back the cable clamp, checking it's perfectly straight and completely secure. Last of all we need a micro SD card, and it's onto this that we're going to install our Motion Eye operating system, which will run our Raspberry Pi Zero instead of the usual Pi OS. For this we'll need another computer, and in my case I'll be using a Mac. The quickest way to find it is by searching the internet, or better still, clicking on the link in the description, taking us to the GitHub repository where all the files live. Fortunately for us, we don't need to pick through what does what, as in the README there's a link to the installation wiki, and it's here in supported devices that we can find the version of the operating system for our Raspberry Pi Zero, and download the latest iteration, although it has to be said that's from a little while back. Once downloaded, we need to get it installed, and for this I'm going to use the Raspberry Pi Imager, which even though it's primarily designed for Raspberry Pi's own operating system, it's ideal for what we want to do here, making the job super easy. Simply selecting the Pi Zero from the device's drop-down, and instead of choosing a Pi OS, dragging our downloaded file onto the operating system field. Finally choosing our SD card as the destination storage device. Now we're offered a bunch of options. No, we don't want to customise the settings, and yes, we are happy to erase the card. I'm pretty sure Windows users get asked the same questions, but some of the others might be unique to the Mac, or at least look very different. And it's because most of the other videos I found on YouTube use Windows, I thought it would be useful to run through the process for fellow Mac users. This bit of the installation is quite similar, and only takes a couple of minutes. When complete, we're told we can safely eject the card, which has automatically unmounted itself, so no longer appears in the finder. But taking it out and plugging it back in again soon resolves that, selecting the card from the list, revealing the files we've just installed. Now we come to stage 2, which for Windows is well documented, but not so much for Mac users, so let me share a method I've found actually works. We need to start by tweaking some finder settings, ticking the box in the advanced menu to show all file name extensions. Then, in order to follow our version of the instructions in the wiki, we need something to create a text file, and the nearest thing available to us is text edit. When we launch that, we can see the files in our SD card, but before we create a new text document, we need to alter some settings there too, switching to plain text rather than rich text, giving us a TXT instead of an RTF when we open a new document. Then back to the wiki to find out what we need to put in it, clicking on Wi-Fi pre-configuration in the right-hand menu. As you've seen, we've not followed the Windows instructions that closely, but here's a bit we do need, and clicking on the icon will copy that text, which can be pasted into our document, when we get a .txt extension to our file name. Now, as per the instructions, we need to tweak that file, firstly changing the country, in our case to GB. Other codes are in the wiki. Then we need the name of our Wi-Fi network, typing it between the inverted commas, which as I found to my cost, are very important to keep. Then the same with the password, which like my network name, is made up for the demonstration. Then we can hit Command S to save the document onto our SD card, complete with its visible .txt extension, and then close it. Now we need to rename the file, copying its new name from the wiki. This isn't just a change of name, it's also a change of function, so it's vitally important we replace everything, including the .txt, changing it to .conf, which is why it was so important to be able to see the text extensions on the file names. Installation complete, we can safely eject the SD card from the Mac and plug it in the Raspberry Pi. 
Now we need to grab some settings so we can see what the camera is seeing. And by far the easiest way of doing this is to plug in a screen using the mini HDMI. And when we power up, it will display the startup routine. This will let us know if we've done anything wrong with the installation. Usually an issue with the configuration file, like leaving off the inverted commas. But this is the information we're here for. The IP address and network is assigned to the Raspberry Pi Zero. We need to make a note of that because we'll be using that later to access the camera feed on the Motion Eye interface. We'll see later on all the things we can do with that, including how to get everything the right way up. But for now, with software installed and camera tested, let's get on with the hardware, starting with the power supply. We've already seen how we can power our Pi Zero with a USB cable, but that's no good to us on the move. We could try and power it through the tracks, but a simpler alternative is a rechargeable battery. And to connect that to the Zero, I'm using this Adafruit power boost, which will also manage the voltages and recharge our battery via the micro USB. My lithium polymer battery plugs in through the standard connector. The inputs are simple enough, but we've got a couple of options for the output, both requiring some soldering. One is to use the USB socket supplied with the charger and a short standard cable to the usual input on the Raspberry Pi. For that, we just need to solder these pins on the back, but that's gonna be really chunky. And with limited space in our wagon, I need a more slimline solution. As well as the standard USB input, we can also power our Raspberry Pi direct from the GPIO pins. And our power boost has two terminals just for that. And instead of that cumbersome USB socket, it's to those I'm going to solder two short jumper cables, from which I've snipped off the plugs, leaving the sockets at the other end. First I'm going to tin the bare ends with a little bit of solder, then putting a similar blob onto each of the terminals will make attaching the wires super easy. You can see I've already had a trial run at this, just to make sure everything works before going on to film. And with my red wire soldered to the 5 volt output, my brown negative can be soldered to the ground. The other end simply plug onto the pins of the Raspberry Pi. Red on pin 2 for the 5 volt input, and brown on pin 6, which is one of the several ground pins. The Raspberry Pi website has a complete list of which pin does which. And when we plug in our battery, which does have a bit of residual charge, the blue LED on the power boost lights up to tell us everything's okay, and the green one on the zero flickers as it goes through the startup sequence. So that's really cool, we got power. But at the moment, we don't have much control over it, having to physically unplug the zero to shut it down, and take out the battery altogether to turn everything off. Fortunately, Adafruit have thought of that, providing an extra couple of terminals, allowing us to add a switch. And luckily, I had a suitable one knocking around, which just needed adapting by snipping off the duplicate legs. The Adafruit website has really clear instructions on how to do this, very much recommending the use of just two pins. So I'm snipping off the one that would connect to VBAT, leaving just the one for EN and the ground. And having stuck it to the edge of the board with a bit of superglue, I can solder the two terminals for both electrical connection and to hold it firmly in place. Of course, you might not want to directly mount your switch on the board itself, but by running wires to those two terminals, you could easily put it somewhere more convenient. Now, with the switch off, when we plug in the battery, nothing happens. And only when we switch it on do we start to draw current, illuminating our blue LED, which lights up even though we've got nothing attached. So with the switch off, let's plug in our Raspberry Pi again. And obviously, only when we switch it on will it start to boot up. The green light flashing as it goes through the Motion Eye startup sequence. And that's the hardware done. We've got a fully functioning, independently powered remote surveillance camera. Small enough to fit in a model railway carriage. And it's the chassis from this old Hornby four-wheel coach I'll be using to get my camera mobile. There's numerous ways we could mount our camera. We could adapt that coach body, or make a simple frame on a flatbed. But as I've got a 3D printer, I'm going to go down that route, specially designing something that will hold all of our bits and look the part on the layout. I've put the CAD files on my website, so if you want to print your own, you can download them from there. Link and the printer settings also in the description. Eventually, I want to use coloured filaments for the different bits, but for now I'll stick with grey, just to test out the fit. And I'm not that bothered with quality at the moment. I can refine my settings for a better print later on. The body comes in three parts, the base designed to clip into the chassis in a similar way to the Hornby original, with bolt holes to attach to the body. These correspond to the mounting holes on the Raspberry Pi, which will be attached on top using four M2.5 bolts, pushed up from underneath. Finally we've got the roof, which has been designed to hold the power boost and the battery. This has been printed with tree supports, which can be levered up and broken away to reveal the recesses. I've also got a little square for a sticky fixer, and some lugs for the holes on the power boost. The finish on the underside isn't great, but that really doesn't matter as no one's going to see it. 
Then with all our parts assembled, let's get on with putting them together. Starting by pushing a couple of our bolts through the holes in the base and then through the lugs in the body, completing our sandwich with the Raspberry Pi Zero, placed on top and secured with the nuts. These are a bit fiddly with the limited space available, so you may want to use tweezers, but once they're on you can tighten up with a fingertip first and then the Allen key. The ones by the headers are even more tricky, but after a couple of goes I got those on too. And when all four are in place, we can go on to fit the camera, for which I've got a square hole in the front of the wagon, exactly the size of the lens mount. The snug fit itself holding it in place, and the ribbon cable snakes round behind. Then we can clip it to the chassis. Once again, the relatively tight fit will hold everything in place. Now onto the roof section, which will house the components of my power supply, the lithium polymer battery and the power boost, each held in place with a sticky fixer, recessed so they don't bulk out too much. The space in the housing does most of the work, the sticky pad really only being there to stop the battery dropping out when the roof's turned over. Then we got the same for the power boost, and while I put in some lugs for the bolt holes, they really aren't needed, and just made everything more complicated than necessary, the sides of the recess and the sticky fixer being more than enough to hold it in place. Then with the battery plugged into the power boost, which I accidentally left switched on, that's the roof section complete. And now time to reunite with the body, plugging our two jump leads into the Raspberry Pi, and flicking the switch, the blue LED lighting up immediately, followed by the flickering green light as the Raspberry Pi boots up. It's worth remembering this is an indicator of disk activity rather than power, so the flickering is perfectly normal, as is the red light on the camera coming on briefly and going out again. And when it comes on and stays on, the process is complete. Then we can close the roof, tucking in the wires. This just clips on so we can access that switch. With the Motion Eye software running, the camera is already beaming pictures across our network. If you remember back to the setup, it was in that script that we gave it permission to do so. Now we want to see what it's looking at, and we can do this on another device connected to the same network. And for that we're going to need the IP address, the one we found earlier. This we can type into the browser on our computer, or even a smartphone, which takes us straight to the Motion Eye interface, showing us our camera image, beamed live across our network. At the moment, that's upside down, and while we've got some basic controls in our burger menu, we're going to have to dig deeper to get it the right way up. For more advanced settings, you'll need to log in, the default username being admin, and no password required. Here we find an extended range of options, and in general settings, we can change that username and add a password if we require. There's lots of other settings, but the ones we're here for are for the video device, and it's here we can set the camera orientation, changing it to 180 degrees and hitting the apply button, then everything is the right way up. In the same menu, we can set other parameters, such as the video resolution, we can experiment with that later, but for now I just want to set the frame rate to the maximum, which even though it's not that high, will suit our purposes, if anything adding to that CCTV look and feel of our unfiltered camera. Before we get the wagon cam on the track, there's one final addition I want to make, which is to fit some bright headlights, so we can see what our driver sees all the way around the track, including inside the tunnels. And for this I'm using some bog standard LEDs which will fit in the 3mm holes in the front of my print design, taking advantage of the space either side of the camera. Even then, room is quite limited, so I'm cutting the legs of my LED short. This makes handling a bit tricky, but a double-sided sticky pad stuck to my work surface will help keep the bulb steady while I do the soldering, my trusty and rather rusty third-hand tool helping with the wires. I've left the positive leg a little longer, so I still know which is the anode. That can have a red wire, black for the negative, soldered onto the shorter leg. Then exactly the same for the second LED. Red wire to the longer anode, black to the shorter cathode. Now to insert them into the holes on the body. A pair of tweezers proving invaluable. The fit is nice and snug, so they just press home, without needing any glue to hold them in place. The dome fronts of the bulb sticking out slightly. My lights are going to be powered by the 3.3 volt output from the Raspberry Pi. And unlike my realistic loco lamps, I actually want them to be as bright as possible. So I'm wiring them in parallel twisting together the stripped ends of the two red wires, onto which I'm going to solder a jump lead, with a socket to plug into the GPIO pins. I would usually use a resistor for realistic brightness, but that's not what we're looking for here. I want maximum illumination, without blowing the LED of course. Then with my red wire attached, the join protected with a bit of insulating heat shrink, I can do the same with the black twisting together the two wires and soldering on my jump lead, again protecting the join with a bit of heat shrink. I won't actually shrink that yet, I'll make sure everything works first. And for that we need to reconnect our power supply, pushing the plugs onto the pins as before, 
the wires for the lights connect in a similar way. The negative onto any one of the ground pins. I've chosen pin 9. And the positive onto pin 1, the 3.3 volt output, leaving three spare pins in between. As soon as we flick the switch, the lights come on, even though the Raspberry Pi hasn't finished its startup routine. Then back on with the roof, although I'll need to spend a bit of extra time getting those wires tucked away in order to get a good fit. But the brightness is great, illuminating even the darkest of places, and even though they run down our battery more quickly, there's plenty of juice for a good running session before needing to recharge. For my latest version of Wagon Cam, I've tweaked the 3D print files, mainly to get a better fit for the roof, and it's the download link for these that you can find in the description. I've also reprinted in colour, to get that engineery kind of look on the outside, complementing the CCTV style of the streamed footage on my laptop or mobile. Finally getting to see what my driver's seeing, as well as having the giant's eye view.